Here on my channel, you know, I talk a lot about taboo subjects, including sex positivity, which often gets my videos demonetized or severely restricted with the ad revenue on YouTube. So that's why your support means so much to me. If you watch this channel and you do enjoy my content, why not consider becoming a patron like my newest patron, Chip? Your small monthly contribution helps keep this channel alive. So just go to patrickmorano.com. The link is in the description below for all the ways in which you can support. 1991, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. It's January in the height of summer, and even tucked away in his dressing room, he can feel the energy of the crowd filling the stadium. This stadium, which when it was built was the largest in the world, plays host to football games normally, but this week in January, the stadium would be the stage for some of the biggest names in music. Prince, Billy Idol, Guns N' Roses, the Backstreet Boys, and the British singer-songwriter, George Michael. He sits in front of the mirror, a glazed look on his face as he takes in this moment. Thinking of the past, his mind shuffles through the faces that have marked his memories, his Greek immigrant parents, his wham partner in crime, Andrew. But one face doesn't exist yet. It's a face he's longing to know, a face to wake up to every day, a face to kiss goodnight. It's the face of his first true love. It's a love that he's resisted up until now, and at 27, with no love interest, no boyfriend, no partner, he has everything anyone could ever want or need, success, money, fame, lacking the one true thing we all desire, a loving partner. A knock at the door snaps him out of his trance. 10 minutes, George, says the face that pokes around the corner, and then disappears into a throng of performers, backup dancers, and musicians, all hustling backstage. He knew he had to focus. This was the second edition of Rock in Rio, the biggest music festival on the planet. The stadium alone could hold upwards of 160,000 people, and he was headlining the night. As he walks the halls towards the stage, the noise of the crowd is undeniable. A bead of sweat travels down his back. The Brazilian summer is humid, even without the sun. Waiting in the wings, he scans the crowd, a jumble of happy faces, some screaming, some smiling, some chatting with their friends, and all of them waiting to see him. Then, the lights go down and the music starts. His first song, a cover of Killer by Adamski. And with one final inhale, he steps into the spotlight, onto the stage, and George Kiriakos Panayutu becomes George Michael. It's like being on autopilot. The words flow from his chest, the movement spontaneous, but somehow rehearsed. The cheering crowd, a blur of faces and flags, the lights blinding him from the enormity of the stadium. Over three quarters of the way through his set, he starts singing Careless Whisper, a hauntingly beautiful song. And halfway through, he looks to his right and into the crowd. And there, those flirtatious eyes are staring back those hauntingly beautiful eyes. Those eyes belong to Anselmo Filippa. He's standing in the crowd, crushed by the people. He's uncomfortable, he's hot, his feet hurt, but none of that matters. He's come here to see one of his favorite artists, after all. How many times would George Michael come to his home country, and only 50 miles from his hometown of Petropolis? He came expecting to sing. He came expecting to dance. He didn't come expecting to fall in love. But standing there, staring up at the man on the stage, that's exactly what happens. George reaches the chorus of Careless Whisper and purposefully moves to the other side of the stage. If I stay staring at that man, I'm going to forget the lyrics to this damn song. He tries to avoid the Brazilian man that got his attention, but like a moth to a flame, he heads back to the other side of the stage for another look. What force is it that lets you know that someone is going to be a part of your life? That they're going to be a meaningful, important person for you? Whatever that force is, they both feel it in that night, in that moment, on that stage, in the stadium, on that hot January night in Rio. As he sings the final notes and takes his bow, George makes his way back to the dressing room. People congratulate him along the way, but his mind is holding on to the image of that man and those eyes. Back at the Copacabana Palace Hotel, George is crossing the lobby, heading to the tour bus parked outside. He glances over at the bar, and there he is, the Brazilian, the connection, the eyes, standing, drink in hand, casually talking to a beautiful woman. Confusion sets in as he continues to cross the lobby. How could I feel such strong attachment for someone who's already attached and not even gay? He looks at the woman, 
lucky cow. Anselmo locks eyes with George and sends a message through the air. I see you. I'll find you. George climbs the stairs of the tour bus and they start the 200 mile journey to Armaceo dos Buzios, a beach resort island for some much deserved R&R. Anselmo is used to making his own luck and this would be no different. You see, one of his closest friends is a Brazilian socialite named Lucia. And she happens to be staying near George's island with her children. A close friend and confidant, Anselmo convinces her to accompany him to George's island. Lucia has a soft spot for Anselmo, as people tend to do that meet him, and she agrees to go. The mission is clear. Anselmo needs to get close to George. He needs to know if George feels the same way as he does. And it's within George's eyesight on the island that Anselmo peacocks for him, dancing and showing off his carefree attitude. I know you saw me at the concert. I know you see me at the hotel and at the bar. And here I am. I'm here for you. Now, normally somebody traveling 200 miles to find George would send him running. But this is different. He isn't scared. He's already falling in love. It's not until a party on a rooftop terrace that Lucia and Anselmo have to sneak into that the two men talk for the first time. Drawn together like opposite ends of a magnet, the world around them melts away. Come what may, their fates are sealed together forever from this moment on. It's in this setting with the Atlantic waves crashing on the Brazilian sand, the palm trees swaying in the gentle summer breeze, cold cocktails in hand, that George Michael and Anselmo Filippa spend three days of absolute bliss. Anselmo is an accomplished fashion designer and George an international pop sensation, but these three days might be the most important days of their entire lives. Both men are happier than they've ever been, and for George, the fame, the money, it all pales in comparison. Anselmo's joie de vivre brings George's playful side. His laugh comes easier. His smile lingers a little longer. He's more outgoing and enjoys outdoor adventures. He's alive. As happy as the two men are, they have to be careful. They don't hold hands in public. Anselmo comes from a deeply religious family and George is not out to his family or to the public. So it's stolen kisses, hidden glances and private moments behind closed doors. He may be one of the most successful recording artists of the time, but he isn't free to be himself. Not completely. Not yet. It's Anselmo that gives George the courage to be more himself. It's Anselmo that allows George to love himself so deeply. Nothing else matters. And so George finally comes out to his work colleagues and close friends, empowered by the man beside him. Anselmo follows George back to LA where they stay for the next year while George is busy recording. During downtimes, they holiday in Greece and Cyprus and visit George's many homes. But life can give life and it can take it away. It's November 24th, 1991, and news that Freddie Mercury dies from AIDS-related complications shakes the planet to the core. Shock, grief, disbelief, a music legend cut down in his prime by a deadly disease. George enters the room where Anselmo is lying down. His flu-like symptoms don't seem to be getting any better. They read the stories of Freddie Mercury's last days together, mourning for the loss of such a talent. In the early 90s, an HIV diagnosis was almost certainly a death sentence. Drugs can ease the transition and prolong your life, but for how long? George feels Anselmo's forehead. He's still weak and he doesn't want to leave him, but the Christmas holidays are just around the corner and he has to return home to England. At the family home in Radlett, Hertfordshire, Christmas is in full swing. The tree twinkles with lights and tinsel, garland is strewn about, and a mistletoe hangs over the doorway. George puts on a brave face. He's happy to see his family, who always comes together for the holidays, but he's distracted and worried. Sitting around the Christmas table, the friendly chatter is just a low hum of noise as his mind races. He smiles, he chews the food, he drinks the wine, but he's not really there. He's terrified and his family has no idea. No idea about his homosexuality, no idea about Anselmo, no idea about his possible HIV status. It's the darkest and loneliest time of his life, and Anselmo is a world away. The news is welcome relief when George is told he's HIV negative. New Year's Eve 1992 passes and Anselmo arrives in England. He doesn't have to say a word. 
George can see it written all over his beautiful face. He rushes towards them and the two embrace for what seems like forever, neither one wanting to let go for fear they may never embrace again. April 20th, 1992, the Freddie Mercury tribute for AIDS awareness at Wembley Stadium. It's a concert whose 72,000 tickets sell out in three hours, even before any performers are announced. A concert to celebrate Freddie Mercury and to raise money for AIDS research. Performing at the concert, George Michael. When he steps on stage and looks out into the crowd, he's choked with emotion. He sings the songs of a man he had worshipped who had just passed away in the same way he's about to lose his first love. Every song is in honor of Freddie Mercury and a prayer for Anselmo. The following months tick by and every spare moment is spent together, memorizing his face, his movements, his laugh, soaking in his love and life like a sponge with water. After the new year 1993, the pair enjoy time away in the Caribbean. The sun is warm on their skin. How could they know this would be their final days together? With George back in LA for work and Anselmo in Brazil seeing family, he takes a terrible turn for the worse. And before anyone can even realize it's happening, Anselmo dies at 36. The phone rings in LA. George picks up the receiver. It's Lucia, her voice trembling between sobs. It's Anselmo. He's gone. The next day, George writes his parents a letter, a letter freeing him from the cage he's been living in. He comes out as gay and explains he just lost the man he loved. And Selma was George's soulmate and savior, a blessing gone too soon. Three years go by and all the pain, all the love comes out in a song written for Anselmo called Jesus to a Child. The rhythm of the song is influenced by the bossa nova style prominent in Brazilian music and it skyrockets to number one in eight countries. And for the rest of his life, George will dedicate Jesus to a child to Anselmo whenever he performs it live. Thank you for watching. And for a deeper dive, why not join the growing number of people who signed up for my newsletter? It's absolutely free and full of goodies and stories that I don't share anywhere else. Just go to patrickmorano.com. And I'll see you in the next video. Mwah!